Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this Tuesday, March 19th, 2024 edition of Trading Places Live at EarningsBeats.com. I'm Tom Boley, Chief Market Strategist here at Earnings Beats, and I'll be your host for the next 30 minutes or so as we prepare for yet another market day. Uh, yesterday was kind of interesting, got off to a pretty good start, a uh, pretty good start to the week, which is unusual, actually, for the Monday after options expiration. That typically is the worst calendar day of the year, uh, well, of each calendar month. Um, but that didn't really play out yesterday, at least not the opening bell. After the opening bell, we saw a little bit of strength in the morning. And then we saw selling pretty much throughout the balance of the day, closing in uh, most cases at or near session lows. So it was a good day if you just looked at the close, but not a great day if you looked at the intraday action uh, or if you were watching the intraday action or trying to trade the intraday action on a long, you know, from a long perspective. So uh, kind of a mixed day, I would say yesterday, but we did finish positive across most areas of the market, small caps and mid caps did, did uh, lag a little bit. Let's take a hit, uh, look at that action. Um, and before we uh, take a look at all of that though, I do want to thank everybody for responding uh, to uh, my plea, if you will, uh, because we did a our first weekly, it was an EB weekly market recap and got a huge response on YouTube. So I want to thank all of you. I tried to respond to every comment individually just to thank you uh, since I had uh, put out a, a special invitation, I guess. Um, but let's go ahead and take a look at the action from uh, Monday. The Dow Jones Industrial Average, just a di little different way. I mean, all I've done is I've zoomed in from the uh, main page over at Stock Chart. So if uh, you're on your dashboard, I'm just looking at this information here and then just zeroing in on it. So you can see that uh, maybe a little bit clearer. Anyway, the Dow Jones Industrial Average yesterday finished up 75 points. That was about two tenths of 1%. S&P 500 gaining 32. That was six tenths of 1%. And the NASDAQ actually showed leadership yesterday, though, again, it was mostly a lot of that leadership was in the morning. We saw a, a pretty big, well, not big sell off, but just steady selling throughout much of the day. NASDAQ did finish up though 130 points, which was about eight tenths of 1%. So clearly it was the relative leader. Uh, and if you look at just the NASDAQ 100, that actually gained almost a full percentage point. So a lot of those large cap NASDAQ names, which have led this rally primarily since the beginning of 2023, were back at it again yesterday, though. Again, most of it was at the open and in very early action. I'd rather see more of that strength coming in the afternoon and toward the close. So it wasn't, wasn't a great day, but it wasn't a, a horrible day either. Um, small caps, you can see, did fall four-tenths of 1%, uh, four-tenths of 1%. The uh, S&P 400 mid-cap down two-tenths of 1%. We saw the VIX actually relatively flat. <clears throat> Earlier in the day when the market was doing its best, it was down, but it did rally back, get close to the center line, it's still at a fairly low level. Um, it's not down where it was when it was, you know, 12, but it also isn't in the 20s, um, which is where I would be much, much more concerned about the market. So VIX has room to the upside. I think if we do see some additional selling and we do have futures down this morning a bit, um, then maybe the VIX, you know, again, I've been saying somewhere in that 16, 17 range is where I would expect maybe that the lid would be. Outside shot at 20, I really don't believe we're going to see the VIX get back up into the 20s for quite some time. But again, 16, 17, certainly possible if we see any short-term selling with an outside shot, outside shot maybe of getting up and touching 20. Futures though, let me give you the numbers where we sit right now. Um, heading into the market open, we're about uh, 25 minutes away. The diamonds right now are down about five one hundredths or half of a tenth of 1%. Uh, we've got the S&P 500 of the Spider SPY down about a quarter of 1%. The QQQ is down just about one half of 1%. It's down the QQQ is down another $2.10. Yesterday, I think it was up at the high over 40, 441. So it's gone from 441 yesterday in the morning to now at 435.38, so roughly you know six dollars shaved off since a little less than 24 hours ago. So we have definitely seen a little bit uh, of a pullback in the QQQ. 
Of course, Max Payne options expired last Friday. So we always talk about uh, Max Payne. If those of you, uh, well, for those of you that aren't familiar with Max Payne, it's simply a term. I mean, I know it sounds horrible, Max Payne. That sounds like we're going to go to zero. Um, but Max Payne is just a term that's used to determine the point at which um, all of the in the money call premium and all the in the money put premium would basically offset one another. It's not exactly, actually max pain is the, is the point at which it will uh, market makers are required to pay out the least amount of premium. So if you've got a ton of call in the money call premium, which we've had, which we had this month because of the big run up, a lot of calls in the money puts not so much. Because most folks, when they buy puts, they're buying them near the money. As the market keeps going up, it just wipes out those puts. So going into option expiration week, we had a lot of in-the-money calls. And that normally translates into a max pain level that is beneath current price action. And I don't recall the exact numbers, but I think on the S&P 500 and on the NASDAQ, it was about 7% lower. Maybe on this, I think small caps were like 6 7% lower as well. Doesn't mean we're going to go down six or seven percent. That's what I always try to stress at every one of these uh, monthly max pain events that we do with our members at uh, Earnings Beats. We do it the Tuesday before options expire. So we did it a week ago. But what we told members at that time was max pain is telling us that the directional clue on our major indices is to the downside. And we gave out some specific stocks, one of them, SMCI. Now, SMCI, one, um, one week ago was up, I don't know, 1100 or um, I, SMCI, the close last Tuesday, and we can look at the chart and just make sure, but uh, 1163, $1,163. Max Payne, 875. So that was the potential of a drop of 25% on SMCI. Now, and let's just take a look. SMCI, um, last night, I believe, I don't know, I just saw the news this morning, so I'm assuming it was last night, maybe it was this morning, but SMCI came out and announced they were gonna do a secondary offering. It's not really a big secondary offering, but as soon as anyone sees secondary offering, they think dilution and they hit the sell button. So SMCI this morning, down $104. 1044, 10.44% down to 896.20. <clears throat> now, this is one week ago. It was, a, it was 1163. And what we tell our members is it's not that we believe or that we were expecting some so, sort of a major move to the downside. It's not like we're guaranteeing that SMCI is going to have a huge move to the downside. But what it does tell us is that the risks are elevated. And so if you're looking to buy SMCI last week, you could do it, but you'd be doing it with a lot of risk, a lot more risk than normal. Because this whole max pain thing is a short-term market inefficiency. That's all it is. It has nothing to do with the long-term. It is simply every month these options expire and market makers can make more money if prices move in the direction that they want them to. And in the case, of SMCI, we are now at 896. Max Payne, we talked about a week ago, was 875. We're almost there. The entire 25% down move is just about there in five days. That's why we follow Max Payne. Last week, not a good time to get in. This morning on this news and the big gap down, if you're not in SMCI, but you want to get in, I'm not saying it, it's not going to go lower. Obviously, it could go lower. The market could take a hit. We could see the stock back down six, seven hundred. But this thing was up over twelve hundred. Now it's under nine hundred. If you're waiting for a pullback, what more are you waiting for? That's all I'll say about SMCI. But again, this is why we do Max Payne. This is why we have that meeting with our members every single Tuesday before op monthly options expire. Monthly options expire the third Friday of the month. We have the meeting three days before the third Friday of the month. You can mark your calendar. But this was a perfect example. Now, another one, I mean, NVIDIA, um, that was one that had a big um, net in the money call premium. 
I think it was the biggest that we saw. It's probably the biggest that was in the market. Um, and NVIDIA, when you look at it um, a week ago, it was probably 900 and something. I think I might have had it on my list here. No, I think we did it as of Friday, the prior Friday, which would have been a week before. And that was at 875. But let me pull up the chart and I can tell you exactly where it was last Tuesday. So last Tuesday, March 9th, or March 12th, um, we had closed at 919 and right, and we closed at 884. So NVIDIA's max pain we calculated was 666. Did we go to 666? No, we didn't. Most of the time we won't. But max pain worked because one week ago we were at 919. We suggested it was going to be a directional move to the downside, and we went down to 884. So simply by holding off and waiting, you could have gotten a much better price to get into NVIDIA. So it's again, it's not about having massive sell-offs or whatever. It's not about a guarantee of some sort of market collapse. It's just telling us that the, the, the risk is too great to buy NVIDIA last Tuesday. NVIDIA could have still gone to 1,000 or 1,100. But that didn't change the fact that it was risky, too risky to get in. So anyway, I just wanted to kind of go over that because some of these moves to the downside seem kind of subtle and they have been on the overall market. But the S&P 500 last Tuesday, the spider was at 516. Let me pull the spider up and show you this. So the spider was at 516 right here. Yesterday, we closed at 512.86. Okay, so we were down and it was 7.5%, the S&P. Uh, had a potential loss if it were to go all the way down to max pain. Now, again, that is not what I'm expecting. I just know it's giving me a pretty good signal that we should expect the market to maybe move lower. The odds are greater that we would move lower, and we have from that since that time. The QQQ was at 443.66 one week ago. And you can see we went down. We actually gapped up, got back some of those losses. Uh, and then sold off during the day yesterday. Now we've got a couple dollar gap down the day. So right now we're at about 435 and change, or at least we were. Give you the latest there. Uh, 435.18, so we're down a little over a half 1%. But 435.18 is now $8 from where we were a week ago. And I know some of you might be saying, well, wait a minute, options expired Friday. This is Tuesday. Why are you worried about this? Well, what happens on option expiration Friday? when options are exercised. Not all options are just sold. Many are exercised because if you're in the money and you don't wanna pay the tax, you exercise and buy the underlying stock. The cost of the option initially that you paid gets added to the basis. You own the stock, you haven't sold anything yet, according to the IRS. So a lot of times options are exercised and that impact, that max pain impact, can actually fall into the early part of the next week. So I always look from Tuesday to Tuesday, basically, middle part of the following week. We got the Fed announcement coming out tomorrow. So maybe that might have something to do with it. You know, I don't know. We'll see how it all plays out. But my point is, I think Max Payne made another pretty good call for us this, this year or this month because it enabled anybody who was willing to buy some of these stocks to be able to get in cheaper, whether it's the Spider, whether it's QQQ, whether it's NVIDIA, whether it's SMCI, all to differing degrees. But all of those key ETFs and stocks moved lower. So again, thanks to Max Payne, um, helped save us some money. All right, let me uh, move into the sectors and just talk a little bit about what happened yesterday on the sectors. Because we did see communication services and consumer discretionary bounce back yesterday, especially communication services, technology kind of in the middle of the pack. And some of the areas that had been leading recently actually took a back seat yesterday with that gap up. But again, they were selling throughout the day. And this relationship kind of changed as we went throughout the day. Uh, I believe technology was a higher percentage gainer earlier in the session, came back down. And then we had some others that were getting hit harder at the beginning of the day that actually came back and rallied. So kind of an interesting day for sure. 
All right. Um, within communication services, just wanted to point out, internet had a big day yesterday, rising more than three and a half percent. So there was one of your big leaders from yesterday. Um, and I, I like to do that a lot of times to just kind of zero in when I'm looking at this sector summary. I mean, if consumer discretionary here, you've got what, 21 different industry groups. So what led? Automobiles. I don't know if you noticed, Tesla was up $10 yesterday. Finally, been an awful start to 2024 for Tesla. Was it just a temporary bounce? Well, we'll have to see, but at least yesterday we did get a bounce. Um, and that led uh, automobiles back to the upside. Um, but you can see, look at the scooter rank on automobiles right now. <clears throat> zero is the low, 100 is the high. Automobiles, 0 0.8. This group has been under a lot of pressure this year. Um, nice to see at least a little bit of recovery here in the near term. Um, hotels continue to be strong. Gambling, which had weakened, now strengthened at least a little bit yesterday. Um, and then down on the flip side, you had some groups moving to the downside and discretionary. Toys, durable uh, household products, both of these groups you can see relatively weak based on their scooter score. Didn't have any real strong groups lose ground except for maybe home construction. That was very fractional. Um, home construction's got that scooter at 97, still been very strong. And that's a group that I would be careful about or maybe just be watching closely into the Fed announcement tomorrow. Um, personally, I have no idea what Fed Chief Powell's going to say. I don't think that anything has changed. I believe um, inflation will continue to fall. Um, on a year over year basis. And, you know, I think eventually we're going to get the rate cuts. But the language that Fed Chief Powell uses uh, can go a long way to determining what the market does in the near term. If you're sitting back and you're waiting and waiting and waiting for this sell off, you know, even if it is only three to 5%, I mean, maybe Powell says something that, that triggers it. I mean, all he has to do is say, well, we're going to hold off, you know, talking about rate cuts or now instead of three, we may only have two or, you know, we're going to be, we may not have any this year. We're maybe pushing it back next year. We got to watch data. I mean, he could say anything and I don't trust going into these meetings. I don't trust him. So doing whatever you feel is necessary to kind of manage some risk going into this meeting and into the announcement on Wednesday at 2 p.m. Um, that's completely a personal decision. Um, I already feel like to some degree, I'm somewhat being conservative by being mostly in ETFs. Um, currently, I last week I had taken about half of my ETF positions off the table. Um, and that's where I'm sitting right now. I'm thinking about with the weakness this morning, starting to move back into some of that. Um, but what everybody wants to do heading into tomorrow, I think that's completely, you know, up to you. If he does say that, hey, we're still on track, we see this as a blip, we're still expecting rate hikes, but maybe we're watching to see when to start them, something like that, market may see, perceive a little bit more bullishly, that could trigger a big move back to the upside. So it just, uh, and if I said, if I'm sounding like I'm not quite sure which way we're going in the short term, it's because I don't quite know which way we're going to go in the short term. So. I'm being really, really clear, even though I'm not being clear. Um, further out, long term, I'm bullish. Uh, there's no misinterpretation there. I just want to make sure everybody's clear. I'm very bullish going forward. I think we're going to be at all-time highs at the end of the year, which are higher than where we are right now. But how we get there, and especially how we navigate these next couple of weeks as we wrap up March, um, honestly, I'm, I'm not bothered by a 3 to 5% move to the downside. I actually would welcome it. So I don't necessarily want to bet against it, but I definitely don't want to bet against the secular bull market. So normally what I do is just kind of manage risk a little bit and stick with the long side. That's my kind of baseline or go-to during a secular bull market, even when I have some caution in the near term. Moving back to the charts, let's move to the 10-year Treasury yield. 10-year Treasury yield this morning. Let's get an update down a little bit, 431, which is down three basis points. We had closed at 434 yesterday. That's kind of a big deal because if you look back, February 21st, we closed at 433. And February 22nd, we closed at 430, or we opened at 434. 
and hit an intraday high of 435.4. So a little bit over 4.35%. Yesterday, the high 4.348. We made our way all the way back up and off of this uptrend, or if maybe you want to call it this uptrend, we have a cup and right now printing a handle. So if the Fed were to come out and say something that spooks the bond market, and we see a bunch of selling in the bond market, which sends yields higher, and we get a breakout, this is what I said a week ago, probably around Max Payne, maybe even a little bit before it. I've been saying if there's one thing that might spook the stock market, it would be higher rates. Well, we've seen higher rates. We've seen a little struggle in the market. But if we were to break back out above that February high in rates, that could certainly be a catalyst to send the market back down three, four, five percent. Wouldn't bank against it. I don't, I think it's possible. Personally, I think five percent for me is about the worst case scenario. I know a lot of people are looking for a lot more selling. I'm not. I think if we were to get back down, um, pull up that SP 500 again one more time. Um, if we were to get back down to, I mean, the 50 day moving average is at 49.72 right now. That's 200 points. That's 4%. Uh, maybe just a little bit less than 4%, 3.5%. I mean, that would certainly be a nice little pullback to help correct some of these overbought conditions that we're in. It would also challenge this gap support level just down below 5,000. Maybe these recent lows you know, 49.25, 49.50. I could see it maybe getting down there, but I wouldn't be saying, oh, Tom said it's going to go down there. That's kind of like the range. And, and honestly, if I'm in a secular bull market, I'm generally willing to take three or 4% downside and keep holding because I don't know how much higher we're going to go. And to me, that's a reasonable risk to take to stick with a secular bull market. But that's the way I view it. You might view it differently, completely up to each individual. Um, NASDAQ 100, um, also moving higher, pulling back, showing a little bit more relative weakness off that high that we saw maybe a week and a half ago. Fed meeting coming up. I'm not quite sure what's going to happen these two days. We do know that, again, pre-market, and we're now seven minutes from opening. And right now, we're down about a half percent on the QQQ. The IWM, seeing a little bit more weakness here. Um, one of the things that I look at, and I know, you know, we made a big breakout here. We pulled back. If you go back earlier in 2023 and back in 2022, we had a lot of uh, reaction highs up to about that 197, 198 area. And then we broke through in December, clearing all of that, went back down to 187. I don't believe we're going to see that kind of move to the downside. But could we maybe touch that 50-day moving average? I think maybe we could. And I would say, you know, trend lines are very, very subjective. But what I normally will do is I'll connect either highs or lows. But what I try to do is see where these trend lines, especially if I can get one that looks to be pretty parallel. So we could drag that right out because that was connecting all of those highs right there. So basically, this is the channel we're in since beginning of the year, roughly, on the IWM, which tells us maybe that 50-day moving average, which is just below the channel, maybe that comes into play. You can see these intraday tails sometimes go below. So I, I'm still okay with the IWM short term as long as we're around that 197.5 level. Now, that's short term. That's just looking at the daily chart. Um, that doesn't mean that if we go down to 196 that I'm that I'm completely off board with uh, the IWM, you know, and thinking that it's going to, you know, continue moving lower. What I would say, though, is that you want to step back to a weekly chart. And on that weekly chart, I think a bigger level is the 20 week moving average, which right now is at 195. So we were at over 210. Now we're getting close to 195 to 198 support area that I'm finding multiple different reasons why that support needs to hold. The 20 day, I mean, if we lose the, or excuse me, the 20 week, if we lose the 20 week moving average, it means that trend line's been lost or the channel. It also means that both the 20 day, the 50 day have been lost, and then the 20 week. So you're starting to see a lot more technical damage 
on any move below about 195. Personally, what I'm considering doing, and that doesn't mean anyone else should be doing this. I've been in the IWM for a while now. I haven't really been, you know, messed around with that stick of dynamite, the TNA, which is the triple leverage. But if I get a 20 week test, I will definitely have some of the TNA. If we get down to 195, 196, maybe even above that, I mean, I'm just kind of watching the market. I mean, I can't tell you for sure what I'm going to do because I don't know for sure what I'm going to do. But I know as we get closer to that 20 week moving average, I'm going to start to feel much more compelled to take on some additional risk with these small cap stocks. And again, if we get any kind of wording from Fed Chief Powell that sends the 10 year treasury yield moving out uh, above that 435 level, 440, 445, I think that absolutely could be a catalyst to get the IWM down to 195. So some, that's just something I'm watching for. Um, transports, transports have really been weak, much weaker than the overall market. Still watching that 15.2 level. I think that's a key level. Before we get there, we've had a couple recent uh, bouts with 15.4. Uh, we bounced off of that. I think we're going to go down and test this 15.2 level. I don't like, I'll be honest, I don't like continuing to go down, but I think going up, setting a high, setting a low, setting a high, and setting one more low in here to maybe challenge 15.2 would be okay. I just don't want to see this break below 15.2. Now, again, this is just one area of the market. It's just one short-term breakdown on one area of the market. But if you start, you know, if you kind of keep a ledger of bullish things and bearish things, this is one that moves from bullish to bearish. So it just starts to tilt things a little bit more bearishly. So, and that's the way, in my mind, that's the way I, I work through the market. You know, I, I look for signs, signals that give me advance warnings, but then obviously I'm going to be looking for key price support levels. And when they start to break down, in my opinion, they carry even more weight than these advanced signals because most of these advanced signals are based on secondary indicators. This is a primary price support. Nothing is bigger than price support in my mind. So 15.2, we want to watch. All right. Um, if you're not already an EB Digest subscriber, that's our free newsletter. Go over to earningsbeats.com, scroll down, and make sure you sign up. Name, email address, hit that subscribe button. This is an uh, article that I publish three times a week, Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays. Focus on relative strength, earnings, earnings gaps, price support, price resistance, trend lines. I mean, you name it. Sentiment. I'm going to talk to you in just a minute about sentiment. But all of these, these types of things are important to us. I'm not asking that anyone out there kind of replace the way they look at the market with the way I look at the market or the way the earnings beats looks at the market. But maybe you can pick up a couple of things. That's what, I've, that's what I do when I find other people who I think are really smart in the market. All the research I've done with intermarket analysis, all of that I owe to John Murphy. I read his book and I started reading into it and it inspired me. It's like, wow. I didn't realize a lot of these things, these different relationships could help you predict certain things. And so I've taken it to another level, done a tremendous amount of research and trying to figure out ways that we can see what might happen or what's more likely to happen before it happens. Anyway, all of that, you can learn a lot more by being part of this community. I promise you, there's a lot of value in these, these uh, three times a week newsletters that we publish. And if you think newsletter, oh my God, I don't have time. It's two paragraphs in a chart. That's all it is. It'll take two minutes, five minutes, whatever, uh, three times a week. The other thing is if you haven't already downloaded this market history, it's free. I, I made it free. We made it free here at Earnings Beats for a reason. We want you to have it. When I've All the research I've done in my life, to me, this was the biggest eye opener. It was a complete game changer for me in terms of how I approach trading. If you haven't gotten this, go to our website, click on it and get it. It's free. No credit card required. Give us your name and email. The report is free. All right, moving on. I wanted to talk a little bit here about sentiment because I've had questions come up and folks are saying, well, you know, Tom, you're seeing rotation into some of the value oriented. Isn't that the same thing we saw in 2021, right before we had a big drop in the market? You know, why are you? 
why are you feeling like this is different? You know, you're, you're saying it's bullish this time, but that last time you said it was bearish. Why? Well, here's the difference. And it's a fine, well, it's not really a fine line, but it's a line we need to be aware of. And looking at this sentiment chart, the difference between the rotation we're seeing now, which has been more into defensive areas, and the rotation that we saw back in 2021, is that these are secondary indicators. I explained it actually yesterday in the Daily Market Report, and I gave an analogy. I love to use analogies. But I want, to, I want you to think of this rotation in the market as being something like rotating your tires. You know, it's maintenance that you have to do or that you should do, but it's not, the engine's not falling apart. It's a secondary indicator, just a secondary thing on the car that you have to fix. Each, each one of these secondary indicators is like another piece of the car, but this isn't a big piece. I mean, rotation is, it's actually good for bull markets. We like to see rotation because we want wide participation. We want everything. Bring all stocks with us on this ride to the upside. But not everything can lead on a relative basis. So in this case, we're going through a period where we are leading a little bit on a relative basis. Materials, energy, financials, industrials. It hasn't been technology, communication, service, and, and discretionary. Back in 2021, imagine needing an oil change. But imagine in 2021, you're going in to take your car for an oil change, but you see smoke coming out of the back. You open the hood and there's some sparks, you know, and, and you're smelling something burning. You know, while you were driving it, you're hearing these crazy noises, your engine warning lights going on. That's, what we, that's the vehicle we were driving in 2021 at the end of the year when we went in for the oil change. Now what we've got is pretty much a new car, needs the oil change, but is that an indication that, we're, that the engine's about to go? No. We're just taking it in for a little service. Then we're going to have it right back out on the road. It'll be fine. 2021, it was basically all the different signs were telling us we needed an overhaul. Going into 2022, look at where this one-year moving average of the equity only put call ratio was right here. This is where we were then. This is where we are now. Back then, and I've talked about this at Market Vision 2022, and I said back then, this was the biggest problem we had going into 2022 is that the market had gone up for 22 straight months and everybody thought they could make money in the stock market by just, you know taking a dart out, hitting a stock, throwing money in, walk away with a fortune. That's what everybody thought back then because sentiment was so bullish. And when you get extreme bullish readings on sentiment, watch out below. Now, where are we now? Instead of being extremely bullish in sentiment and turning higher, which if you look at every one of these prior major moves to the upside, what happened to the market? Sideways down, mostly sideways, but a big down period. What about here? That was 2014, 15, 16, when we, it seemed really bearish and was a real struggle. Every one of those that were accompanied by resets from being too bullish and there was just no more money to go into the market. Now, when you top, on here, it's the exact opposite. Look at all the best moves we've seen in the stock market, and every one of them occurred with a peak in the one year moving average of the equity only put call ratio, rolling over and moving lower. As this moved lower, huge move in the SP. As we move lower here, huge move in the SP. As we move lower here, huge move higher in the SP. We move lower here, huge move higher in the S&P. What are we doing right now? We're moving lower. Sentiment was too bearish. We're not going back down to the lows, not from this level. I'm convinced. You know, nothing's 100%, but this chart's giving me, making me feel about 99.99% .99 sure that we saw too much selling. Everybody got too bearish. And until we reverse that, 
I don't, I think selling to the downside is limited. This chart right here was like the one that beat me over the head with all the other signals. Now, remember, December 21 had that rotation that I'm talking about now. But do you see the difference in sentiment? So the rotation, in my view, is temporary and bullish. And we, there are occasions, I think 2013, when we first started the bull market, and that's when we broke out of a prior double, double top on the S&P 500. That's why I call it the start. Some look back and say, no, 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 the start was in 2009. That's where the bottom was. Yeah, but 2007, this peak, we didn't take that out in the 2000 peak until we got into 2013. But I believe that year right there was led by financials and industrials from what I remember. I believe technology underperformed. So it's not like we can't go higher if we have financials and industrials and other value areas leading, but it's unusual. Usually we're going to be led by growth. Anyway, I think that's really important. Now I've gone way beyond, um, but I wanted to point that out because I think that's a really, I think this is a game changer of a difference between now and where we were at the end of 2021. Anyway, let's see what the market's doing. Have we rebounded? No. Well, Dow's up. Uh, S&P down uh, three tenths of one percent. Nasdaq going the other way, down seven tenths of one percent. Small caps are up though, so we're seeing that rotation again today ahead of the Fed. I don't know what the Fed's going to say tomorrow, but at least this is the way we're starting out. And I'm looking at some of the leaders. I mean, when I see 3M up near the top, 3M's actually been pretty hot of late. Um, but 3M leading GM, RTX, it's Raytheon, Hershey's. Um, these are more defensive names, and they're at the top of the S&P 500. That gives you a little bit of a flavor. Maybe we look at the bottom, SMCI now down 100. Let's, I'm going to pull up this last thing. I'm just going to look at the intraday and see what's going on here. Yeah, so right now it's down 110. Wow, just like that, $10. But again, from the daily chart, you've been waiting for a pullback. I mean, this is it. We're down close to this gap support level. And I said 600, 700. I mean, the 50-day moving average right now is 732. Maybe we get down there. These recent lows came down just below 700. I would really be surprised if it goes much below 700. So this was a $1,200 stock. Even if you think this might go lower, if you want to own it, I would at least be buying a piece of it. That's just my opinion. I would I'd buy a third of it, whatever you want. Um, if it goes down to 800, buy another third. If it goes to 700, buy the other third. You're averaging it at 800. So if you end up building a position, you get in at 800 instead of putting it all in at 900. You know, that's some, sometimes that's the way I'll, I'll try to, to get in. You're not going to get into SMCI without risk. Sorry, it's just, you don't get into a company that's gone from 300 to 1200 in two and a half months and just jump in on a pullback without risk. I don't know where the bottom is. Again, you got negative divergence, although I would ignore it because when we went up here and we got this PPO over 20, I challenge you to go back and find many stocks that show a PPO on a daily chart of 20. That is tremendous, rapid ascension to the upside. You have to keep that same pace up in order to take out that PPO. It's unsustainable. You can't go up that fast forever. So even though we kept going higher, the pace of it slowed, resulting in a negative divergence. But on this breakout, we had big volume. That's not slowing momentum. So this is the type of negative divergence I wouldn't even be considering. I would ignore it. But um, let this thing play out. You know, maybe pick up a little piece on the way. Again, if that's what you've been waiting for, if SMCI was at 1200 and you said to yourself, I'm not buying, I can't buy this. I have to see a pullback. Most people, what happens is you get the pullback and then they're afraid to buy because they think, oh my gosh, it's gone down so fast. Oh, I'm going to wait, see, maybe I can get it to the next level, next level. Then it goes back up to 11, 1200 and they're like, well, now I'm going to wait until it goes back down to 900 and it may never do it. Anyway, a lot, of, a lot of head games when you're trading, especially a stock like SMCI. Um, but anyway, that's where we are right now heading in. Fed meeting started this morning. Uh, it will end tomorrow. We got more earnings, a few bigger earnings reports coming out later in the week. Um, so maybe some fireworks uh, there. But for right now, um, 
I just say, be careful. Um, this is the period if we're going to get selling, and I don't know if we are. If we are, this is the time where it could happen. Right now, that rotation is really helping the S&P and the Dow, as you can see it today. If that rotation continues, maybe we don't see much of a drop. Hard to say. Anyway, have a great uh, day, everybody. I'll be back tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. for your next Trading Places Live. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe to our channel. It helps us a lot here at Earnings Beats, and we thank you for that. Happy trading.